Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate the invitation to visit with you about the work that's summarized in the title, trying to understand where differences in efficiency across companies come from. And, uh, and you'll see in a second, they're, they're big differences. And, and they, they add up to important things. So in the end, uh, economic growth, the, sp the speed limit on economic growth is productivity growth. And where does productivity growth come from? Well, it comes from producer by producer making decisions about how they're going to operate. And so if we want to understand economic growth, we, at the core of it, need to understand some of the things we'll be discussing today. Um, I'm going to be going over a whole bunch of different work, some done by myself, but much of it also done by other folks looking at similar issues. Uh, we could talk for the rest of today about this literature, but I'm not going to make you do that. I'll just give you a sort of overview over the next hour or so of the things that I and others uh, interested in efficiency differences are, are studying. Okay, so to get started, a little background. So over the past 25 years or so, uh, really for the first time ever, economists have gained access to systematic data on companies' operations. Okay, this data uh, is usually being collected by national statistical agencies, and they've been doing this for decades, but usually what would happen is they'd go take a survey or a census of companies, you know, tell us about your outputs, tell us about your inputs, so on and so forth. They'd add up all the numbers and say, this is total output, this is total input, and then throw the data away, okay, or put it in a file somewhere and never let it be seen again. Uh, about three decades ago, people realized there's a lot to learn in this microdata. Forget just adding it up. Let's look at the individual company's numbers. And moreover, let's link them over time so we can follow companies over time and see how they evolve. And this, uh, much of the work today is going to be um, facilitated by the recent availability of that data. So in the U.S., most of this data comes from the Census Bureau. Uh, they have, we all know about the population side, the demographic side that happens every 10 years, but they also have an economic census that's taken every five years with some surveys uh, done in between. Uh, but uh, U.S. data is not the only data that's driving this body of work. Uh, many, many companies have now made their data available, usually with some sort of confidentiality uh, restrictions, so you have to use the data in a secured facility, and you can't report any individual company's responses in any work you do. Everything sort of has to be uh, statistically hidden or uh, aggregated over. Uh, but here's just a, an example of some countries, uh, it's certainly not exhaustive, uh, whose data has been used to look at the things we're going to talk about today. And you can see it's from all over the world, every continent. Uh, it's from countries with over a range of development uh, profiles. So you have some wealthy economies, some middle uh, income economies, and some still developing economies, uh, all of which people have been using to, um, to learn about where efficiency differences come from. Also, uh, economists have gotten a little bit better at talking companies out of their own data so we can study it. Uh, it's still not the easiest thing to do, but every once in a while you get lucky and you can get production data from an individual company at a super detailed level, and I'll show you some work done with that uh, today as well. So a key, so people use this company level data to look at all sorts of things, but a big portion of that work is the work we're going to talk about today, and that is that focusing on performance. And the, the, the most commonly used performance measure in economics is productivity. Okay, what's productivity? Well, it's, it's how much output a company gets out of a set of inputs. Okay, so you can think of it as it's a ratio of output to inputs. It's how much stuff you get out per unit of factors you put in. Okay? 
you can read that as, as, an, as, as I've already been using the language, efficiency. Okay, it's efficiency in production. You can also think of it, when I talk about productivity, you can also think of it as profitability. If you think about profit, profits, profits is revenues minus cost. Well, take output, multiply it by the price of output. Take inputs and multiply it by the price of inputs. This is sort of like the ratio version of profits as opposed to the difference version of profits, which we're used, used to using. So there's a strong correlation in the data between productivity and profits. They're not perfectly uh, interchangeable, and we don't need to go into that now, uh, why exactly, but they're highly correlated. OK, so a few facts. One, no matter where anyone has looked, and this is now we're talking about uh, dozens of countries, scores of industries, and many, many different time periods, so uh, thousands of studies now in total. People find really large productivity differences across producers, even within what you might think are quite narrowly defined industries. Okay, and again, this is a ubiquitous fact. So what do I mean when I say a narrowly defined market? Well, for example, uh, I'm talking about a market like saw blade manufacturing. Okay, not manufacturing, not even tool manufacturing, but making saw blades. That's pretty specific. You might think, how different can companies be at their proficiency in making saw blades? You stamp some steel, you make some cuts, and there you go, you have a saw blade. White pan bread bakeries is another example. Okay, not, not any old bakery, white pan bread. Not wheat bread, that's a different industry. Not rolls, that's a different industry. This is like Wonder Bread coming out Loaf by loaf by the thousands out of a factory. That's what you should have in mind when I talk about white pan bread bakeries. Lars talked about my history with ready mix concrete. It's been an industry that I've been looking at for a long time. Again, you might think, well, that's about as pedestrian a production process as you could imagine. I like to say it's like making mud pies at a really big scale. You mix up some stuff, put it in a truck, and deliver it and pour it out. Okay, those are manufacturing industries, but you can look at these things outside manufacturing. So say retail, retail, an example of a narrowly defined industry in retail would be bookstores, okay, or gas stations or whatever. That's the sort of scope we're talking about. If you want to get out of retail, go into services, something like business accounting services. Okay, not personal accounting or tax accounting, but accounting for, the, for businesses. That's what I mean by narrowly defined. And what do I mean when I say people always find large productivity differences within these industries? Well, a typical 90-10 percentile productivity ratio within one of these industries, four digit means defined like I described, uh, is about two to one in US manufacturing. So what does that mean? It says, let's go find every ready mix concrete producer or go look at every saw blade manufacturer or whatever, and you line them up within their industry from, in terms of their productivity. So we've counted their outputs, we've counted their inputs, and we've taken the ratio. And we're just going to line them up by that ratio from least efficient to most efficient. Let's throw out the tails, the top and bottom 10%, just because maybe they're special or weird or whatever, or there's measurement problems. So we're just going to focus on the middle 80%. So we have the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile. Well, on average, within one of these narrowly defined industries, that 90th percentile company in the industry is going to be getting twice as much output from the same inputs as the 10th percentile firm. Okay, Same inputs. In other words, I'm going to give both companies the same number of workers, the same amount of capital, and the same total value of intermediate materials. Yet, the standard thing is one company will be able to get twice as much output from those inputs as the other. Okay? That is the typical case. That's not the crazy tail case. That is the average ratio in US manufacturing. Okay? Now, nothing is special about this large dispersion in US manufacturing. If you look at Chinese manufacturing, the average 90-10 ratio is 3 to 1. 
If you look at it in India, it's five to one. If you look outside manufacturing, it's typically a little bit bigger than two to one. If anything, US manufacturing is on the small side in terms of productivity dispersion. So this is what we're talking about. These sort of really big differences in performance. Two companies operating in the same narrow market at the same time, yet they have very big differences in their efficiency of operations. Another fact that people find is that these productivity levels are persistent. If you're an efficient company this year, you're more likely to be considerably more likely to be efficient next year than inefficient. If you're inefficient this year, you're likely to be inefficient next year, if you stay in business. And I'll get back there in a second. So for example, after five years, a third of businesses in the top 20% are still there. If productivity is just a random thing, of course, we wouldn't expect uh, any persistence at all. Those in the second 20% are more likely to be there than anywhere else, and so on and so forth. So you get this sort of stickiness. Now, it's not perfectly persistent. Companies can affect their productivity levels, and we'll talk how, about how that happens. But it's not an easy thing. And it's certainly not the case that if you're having a bad year, you can just wait and things will probably get better next year. Things will probably not get better next year. Okay? Um, moreover, companies that are inefficient, like I said, not only do they stay efficient, they typically are quite often go out of business. So productivity is literally a matter of survival for businesses. Okay? So, and again, this is something people have found no matter what industry, time period, or country you look, the higher productivity companies in an industry are more likely to survive. So just to give you an example, again, in terms of numbers in, in U.S. manufacturing, the bottom fifth are tw two and a half times as likely to go out of business over the next year as someone in the, as a firm in the top fifth uh, within their uh, narrowly defined industry. High productivity companies are also more likely to grow faster in the future. It's good to work for a high productivity company because their workers are paid more. Now, of course, there you might think there's an issue of causality. Is it that productivity leads to higher pay or paying workers more leads to higher productivity? Well, it's a little bit of both, as it turns out. We're not going to have time to go into it too deeply, but it actually does look ca like causality goes both ways. And by the way, Consumers are often better off when productivity goes up too because if companies can produce things more efficiently, that means they have lower costs and typically lower costs are at least partially passed on to consumers in terms of lower prices. Okay. So that I hope motivates the importance of productivity and understanding why uh, or understanding the fact that there are big productivity differences. So let's get to talking about why those productivity differences exist, what things determine whether some companies are efficient or less efficient. So I wrote a, a, a paper that tried to summarize kind of what everyone was thinking about along these lines a few years ago, and I sort of divided explanations into two, kind, two broad sets of factors. So the, the first set are things that companies, at least in theory, have some ability to control. Okay, these I call the, the levers. All right. Then the second set of things are aspects of the market environment that the company uh, operates within that can also affect productivity. Now, companies don't have direct control over these things, but these might affect their incentive to pull the levers in category one. And we'll talk about some of the uh, aspects of, of both of these sets of factors. So, but let's start, uh, go in order, and start talking about the levers. Now, I had came up with six categories of levers. The first is managerial practices or managerial talent. Okay, you can think of the manager or the management team in a company as like a conductor of an orchestra. And even though, you know, as a, a good conductor makes an orchestra sound better, a bad conductor can make an orchestra sound worse, even if the instruments don't change. That's one way to think about what management does. You can have the same inputs, yet really poor performance because the managers don't know how to coordinate the actions of those inputs. A second lever are differences 
in the quality of labor or capital inputs. So man, that gets a little bit at this wage issue. If you can hire workers who are somehow better than other workers or better matched to the type of operations you're doing, you can get more output per worker than if you hire poorly matched workers. Same thing with capital uh, inputs. A third category is information technology and R&D or intellectual property. If you'd like, you could think of this as 2A rather than 3 because in some sense these are specific kinds of capital. The fourth is learning by doing. Learning by doing is, as it sounds, it's becoming more proficient through the very act of operating. The fifth is product innovation. So a lot of times we think about productivity in terms of process. So it's about, okay, I got these inputs and I got to combine them to make this thing I'm going to sell. But you can also innovate rather than on the process side, on the product side. What if you change the product you're making in a way that raises its value to consumers? Now you are making per unit input a more valuable thing. We would probably want to think of that as being more productive, even though it's only the same good, you know, the same physical unit that it always was. It's a more valuable version of that physical unit. And so in some sense, you become more productive. And then the final thing are firm structure decisions. So this is about vertical and horizontal. So vertical is within a production chain. This is the, these are decisions about where are you going to get your inputs? Are you going to buy them on the market or are you going to vertically integrate and make them yourself? How are you going to distribute your outputs as a company? Are you going to use other companies to do that? Or are you going to distribute your own products? That's the vertical aspect. And then the horizontal aspect is how many different kinds of product markets do I want to operate in? And how closely are they related to each other? Are they very different kinds of products or are they more similar kinds of products? And choices about the horizontal and vertical scope of companies interact with their productivity level. All right, now I'm not going to have time to talk in detail about each of these. I'm just going to go through a few uh, with some interesting examples of things that I and others are looking at along these lines about the relationship between these levers and productivity levels. So let me first talk about that first thing I mentioned, which was managerial practices or managerial talent. Okay? Until about 10 years ago, I think it's fair to say management had the highest ratio of people talking about it as a source of productivity differences relative to the actual evidence that it was a source of productivity differences. Okay? Now, you could always have gone to some airport bookstore and there's a whole row of books about how to be a better manager, but that's usually just someone's bad intuition or storytelling about their own experience in business. There really was very little systematic evidence on what particular management practices are done and then which ones are related to better productivity. Okay? But that started to change. Now there are more systematic uh, efforts at trying to collect data on management practices. One is uh, of the best known and the first is the World Management Survey. Um, this is run by uh, uh, an economist at Stanford, Nick Bloom, and, and at MIT, John Van Rienen. And they have, over the past decade, hired folks to survey companies around the world uh, if, in phone interviews that last 45 minutes to an hour where they talk about operations with these companies. Now, the companies don't realize when they, they know they're talking to someone about how their company operates and, and it's a, a research project, but they don't know that while they're discussing what they're doing, the interviewer is scoring them and systematically walking them through a number of different practices. And then on each practice, based on their responses, they're getting scored from low to middle to high quality management practice. And then they put all that data together. Um, this effort has expanded. This is uh, not just the World Management Survey anymore. Um, for example, now the U.S. Census Bureau actually sends out a survey on management practices to about 50,000 companies every few years. And so we're getting more and more, <coughs> excuse me, more and more data <coughs> on companies' management practices. 
So what do you find? Well, here's some data. I'll just show you some basic numbers from, from the World Management Survey uh, data set. If you, uh, as you can see now, they're, they're in, uh, uh, the survey is extended into dozens of countries and you know, hundreds of companies within each of these countries, lined up from highest scoring, i.e. best management practices to uh, least best management practices at the bottom. It sort of lines up with GDP per capita or economic development. Okay? So that's, that's sort of interesting. Maybe it's informative. It's hardly causal. You know, it, it's probably more than just a matter of getting Mozambican companies to manage themselves better to make Mozambique a wealthy country, but we know those things, as we can see in the data, are, are highly correlated. So the U.S., Japan, Germany, Sweden, Canada are the top five, and then you can see the mix uh, within the other countries uh, in the data. Uh, now, these are averages. If you go within any given country, you'll see a big spread around that average. So just like there are big differences in productivity within industries, there are big differences in management practices within in industries. Here, this shows the distribution for just four example countries, US, Brazil, China, and India. So what it's done is the raw data is the histogram, the sort of yellow chartreuse color histogram there. And then the red uh, uh, curve is a kernel density fit to that um, uh, distribution for the U.S. And then the other countries overlays the kernel density of the U.S. management score distribution upon the raw data of Brazil, China, and India. Okay, so a couple points to take away here is, one, like I said, there's a big spread even within countries in terms of management practices. Two, there are, you can see the mean differences in terms of shifts of the distribution across the countries. But three, you can see that there's actually differences not just in the mean across countries, there's differences in sort of the weights of the distribution uh, across different quantiles. So for example, you know, China, if you compare, say, China and India, China actually has a fairly, relatively speaking, small number of really poorly managed companies, but a big bulk of sort of mediocre management companies. Uh, on the other hand, India's got a larger set of really poorly managed companies and hardly any very well managed companies. Same thing with China. The U.S., of course, has very few poorly managed and a, a fairly large chunk of really well managed. Okay? So this just goes to show that there's a big <clears throat> spread in, perform in uh, management practices within and across countries, and these come not just from mean shifts but from other parts of the distribution as well. Now, I showed you how big those average uh, management practice differences are across countries, but one interesting thing shows up when you break out companies within countries into whether they're part of a multinational or just a domestic company. And you can do this for a bunch of different countries in the data, and you can see that multinationals, more or less, are basically well-managed regardless of where they are. Okay, now this is about management. I'm saying, well, People think management is uh, related to productivity differences, and indeed you see that. So this just fits a curve, a nonlinear uh, uh, relationship between total factor productivity. And total factor productivity, by the way, is just output over a bunch of inputs combined in a particular way as implied by the production function. So it's labor, capital, and materials inputs smushed together into a single amalgamation input. Okay? So there's a strong positive and monotonic relationship between productivity and management practice scores. <coughs> it's also highly correlated with good stuff, just like productivity is. So companies with higher management practice scores grow faster, and they're more likely to survive. They're more profitable. The workers get paid more, and so on and so forth. Everything so far is just about correlation. We've seen productivity is related positively to management practice, we haven't really shown that it's causally related. In other words, if I could actually go in and tweak management practices in a given company, should I expect then that productivity will, will go up? Now to learn that, really with like gold standard evidence, you'd have to do some sort of crazy experiment where you take a random set of companies, you go in and change their management practices, you have another random set that's held out as a control group, and then you see how productivity 
changes in the treatment versus control group. Okay, but that's kind of crazy to imagine going and doing experiments with the actual companies in terms of management practices. Well, it turns out economists are crazy. So we have gone and run these experiments. I'm going to talk about one of them, and it's not a big experiment, partly because it's really expensive to do these experiments. Uh, this is one done on 20 cotton fabric plants, uh, all in Mumbai, India. And these are not tiny little mom and pop operations. The average uh, employment at one of these uh, factories is 300 employees, and they're selling $7 million of goods. The treatment group of plants got five months of management consulting advice, where the management consultant, and some of you are going to go work for this company. I'll tell you, I can't say who it is, but I bet some of you are going to go work for this company. Um, and every week, the management consultants would come in, talk with the management of the plant, and say, OK, let's work on this, let's work on that. We're going to implement this thing, that thing, and we're going to do this this way now instead of that way. And then start tracking performance. The control group, now what you really like to do with the control group is nothing. Right? Just nothing happens. Now, it's not that easy. They actually had to measure how well the control group of factories was performing. To do that, they had to go install computers and record keeping things and stuff like that. So that process took a month. And so for a month, the consultants were actually in the control group um, uh, factory. So it's not like a perfect control. So we're really looking at the difference between five months of intensive management consulting and one month of sort of light management consulting. Okay? Uh, so they offered pr uh, advice on 38 specific management practices tied to operations, quality, and inventory control. And then they collected data on the operation of, of these factories over two years. Okay? So if you look at what happened to productivity in these plants, it looks like this. So this is over the first year or so of the experiment. So Week zero was the week that the management consultants showed up for the first time. You can see the red line here is the productivity level of control plants. The black line is the productivity level of treatment plants. And you can see over the course of the experiment, and it didn't happen all immediately, it was sort of a gradual increase, uh, the treatment plants got more and more efficient. And by the end of the first, uh, say, nine months, or so let's say nine months after the intervention started, I mean, that's a better way to say, the treatment plants' productivity levels, even though they're basically the same before as the control plants, were 20% higher than the productivity level in the control plant. So, and because, of course, the only difference between treatment and control was one just got randomly assigned to get the management consultants for five months rather than short visits for a month, we can interpret this difference as being causal that actually implementing some of these 38 practices, by the way, not every company actually, even in the treatment group, implemented every one of the 38. On average, they implemented about two-thirds to three-fourths of them. Uh, but actually implementing these management practices causally raised productivity. All total, the productivity gains uh, that we saw should save a plant about two to $3,000 per year. Now, if you, that's off of $7 million of revenue and probably a profit level of something in that neighborhood. So it's almost a doubling of profit. Okay? And that's net, by the way, of the cost of putting in the computers and keeping track of the things that, that the management consultants say to take track of, keep track of. Okay, so it seems from this experiment, other people have done other experiments like it, sometimes with mixed results. It seems that certain kinds of management interventions are more effective than others, but on average they seem to be effective at raising productivity. That means if we can get companies that are poorly managed to figure out how to make themselves operate better, engage in better management practices, they could raise their productivity level and average productivity levels in the economy would grow up and we would get economic growth. That's important. The problem with this is the first step in getting poorly managed companies to recognize they need to become more efficient is to make sure they recognize they're poorly managed. It turns out companies have no idea how well or poorly managed they are. So what they, this survey did is they asked this company, score yourself 
in terms of the quality of your management practices uh, relative to everyone else in your industry? Are you, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you at? Well, it turns out if you plot the responses, okay, whoops, we're on the horizontal axis versus their actual productivity on the vertical axis, there's basically no relationship. Really well-managed, really efficient, sorry, companies aren't any more likely to say they're well-managed than poorly managed. And inefficient companies don't realize they're poorly managed. Okay, so that's a big issue, and we really don't have a good idea of how to just break it to companies that they're not as good as they think they are. Um, I mean, I'm willing to go in and tell anybody anything, but they're not going to listen to me. We've got to figure out sort of how to, how to demonstrate this in a way that hits home. Okay, so that's management practices. Let me move on to another level, learning by doing. So this is something I did with uh, uh, Steve Levitt and John List, who are also are in the econ department. We studied learning by doing in an auto assembly plant over the course of a production year. So what we had in, the, uh, uh, in our data is the step-by-step -step assembly of every car made in that plant over the course of a year. So there's about 200,000 cars, and there's hundreds of steps that go, in together, that, that go together to assemble a car. And we got to see for every one of them whether that step went right or whether it resulted in a defect. Okay, so we were able to count up every defect in every single car and look at how that changes over time. This is actual data that we use. This is an example. So what we see here, each line is a step. Okay, this is all one car. So here's a VIN. VIN, VIN is a vehicle identification number. Every car made gets a unique VIN. Okay, so this is one car. And in fact, this is just a dozen observations of, out of hundreds for this particular car. What do we see? Well, we see uh, the process that's happening and a description related to the outcome. The department and the zone and the team in the, of the factory that's op doing that operation, so where and whom did the operation, and then we see a timestamp. So this operation happened on uh, the 18th of April at 9.10 in the morning, uh, sorry, 10.09 in the morning. And there was no defect, okay? when this process happened. However, when someone tried to uh, um, attach the air conditioning line to the shock tower, it didn't go on tightly. And then it was short on the other side, shy means short. And then the other one, it wasn't seated to the block. Okay, so whoever was doing the air conditioning line was having a bad car. Right? So we have three defects there. Here's another one where the left A post plug is shy, and so on and so forth. So we see this for every single car. If you look at the number of defects per car over the course of the production year, and this shows the entire year, this is weekly data, average number of defects per car over the week, this is what it looks like. Okay? So th this turns out as a classic learning by doing pattern. You have really high uh, defect rates or really low productivity, so you can think of quality as sort of the inverse of productivity. Uh, at the beginning, the, you get some quick gains, and then they sort of slow down, but you get gradual gains after that. And that's what we found. So they got defects per car down from 80 per car in this week to, by seven weeks later, it was down below 30. So they had about a 70% drop in defects per car over the first eight weeks of operation. By the way, we threw out the first couple weeks of production where they're only making a few dozen cars, um, but those had several hundred defects per car. And those, by the way, they get, they get sold. So <laughs> if you're going to buy a car, and there's a, there's a stamp that will tell you, there's a sticker, when that car was made. If it is a new, if it's after a redesign, so most cars are, have a major redesign every five years or so, if it's the first year after a redesign and you see it's made in July or August or September, pass, okay? <laughs> Um, one interesting thing that this factory did is it ran two shifts, but it didn't start the second shift until after seven weeks of operating on just one shift. Okay? So we broke out defects per car depending on what shift was operating when the car was being put together. And very interestingly, I told you about these huge drops in defect rates that occurred during the first seven weeks. That was all on the first shift. Now the second shift starts. The second shift workers had not made a car to that point. 
Okay? Their only training was to watch the, the first shift for one week before they started. But somehow, as soon as they start operating, they don't have a bunch of defects. Everything that was learned by the first shift somehow got immediately transferred to the second shift. Okay? And that tells us something about the nature of learning and where the sort of knowledge stock resides in a company. It doesn't seem to be, at least in this company, doesn't seem to be with an individual worker because these workers are different than these workers. If it's about the worker, these guys should have to relearn everything, but they didn't. Somehow, whatever was learned by the first shift workers got put into the production process in a way that second shift workers could just show up and operate at the new lower defect levels that the first shift had achieved. However, if you look at model by model, and this factory made three models over the course of the year, but also staggered the start of production of each model, there was relearning when new models were started. So when the second model starts, there's a little bit of a spike in defect rates. They don't start where the first model was at at the time they start. And then when the third model version of the, the car starts, again, they have another spike in defect rates. Um, and as you can see, interestingly, if you squint a little bit, you can see defect rates actually rose in Model 1 a little bit when they started Model 3. And there's a reason why. Model 3 is sort of a special version of Model 1. I can't talk about what model it is, but it's a special kind of car that's related to this one. And they had so many problems with this, they were basically were taking resources away from quality control on Model 1 and applying it to trying to fix what was going wrong with Model 3. Absenteeism also, you might think, is related to learning by doing, and we found that, but it turns out it's really small. So <clears throat> absenteeism in this factory is no small thing. Average absenteeism was 14%. That means on any given day, one out of seven workers was not at work. However, even if you could cut absenteeism down to zero, turns out the relationship between the speed of learning and absenteeism is slow. You'd only cut defect rates by 5%. Okay, so by the end of the year, you're talking about defects per car of a 10. You know, even if you got rid of absenteeism per completely, that would just drop that to 9.5 per car. It's not, it's not that important. So again, that suggests it's not so much about the workers keeping the learning in their head. It's the factory has processes that get what the workers learn out of their heads and into the production process itself. So any given worker can show up, start operating on the factory floor, and gain all the knowledge that other workers who have done the same things before them uh, 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 enjoy the gains of that, of that learning. OK. So now let me move on to external factors. Those are just a couple of the levers. Let's move on to these sort of market environment things. I talked about four different kinds of environmental factors, external factors in that, that paper I was talking about. One is productivity spillovers. This, is, this can be, you can think of that as learning across companies. Okay, I see what a, another company is doing, and I figure out how to do it, and I do it, or I hire one of their former employees, and they bring that, their processes into my company. That's a, what we're talking about with spillovers. The second is competition. Competition both within markets domestically as well as perhaps through trade. Third is regulations, the regulatory environment. And fourth are, is input market flexibility, how easily labor and capital can move around the economy. And again, I'm not going to be able to talk about each of these in detail, but I'll just go over some examples. So let's focus first on competition and productivity. This is a big thing for economists, of course. We, we think there are a lot of good things about competitive markets, one of which is it encourages efficient operations. Okay? Now, there are two mechanisms through which this can happen. One is that when you're in a really competitive market, you better figure out how to be competitive because if you're not, your competitors are going to take business away from you. So your incentive to become more efficient, we think, is typically higher in more, in more competitive markets. The second mechanism is a sort of Darwinian process, where even if a company can't change its own productivity levels, if competition grows the more efficient companies and forces the less efficient out of business, average productivity in the market will go up, even if no individual company is getting more efficient. Okay, That's, that's sort of a a selection process. Or if you'd like to think about it in terms of statistics, 
The first one is a within process. The second one is a between process. Okay. All right, now both mechanisms matter. How much each one matters depends on the sector. So for example, typically if you look in manufacturing, it's about 50-50. Of total average manufacturing productivity growth, about half comes from individual manufacturers becoming more efficient. The other half comes from the market reallocating activity away from less efficient manufacturers and towards more efficient manufacturers. If you look at retail, on the other hand, it's almost all through selection. So it's rare to see a retail store actually become more efficient over time. Sort of as they're going to be, they're as efficient as they're ever going to be when they open up for business for the first time. A lot of retail productivity growth comes instead from the efficient retailers growing and the less efficient ones shrinking. All right, so let me give you an example from a, my favorite industry, ready mix concrete. Right? So again, concrete is concrete. It's a big clump of mud in some sense. Okay? It's just made with special ingredients. So what limits competition? You know, there's, there's no brands of concrete. No one cares about it. There's not really big quality differences. What matters in terms of competition is space. Okay, this stuff is really heavy relative to its value, and it's perishable. Once you add the water, you got about 90 minutes to get it out of the truck or the truck is ruined. Okay, so this stuff isn't going very far. So competition is limited by density. When you have a lot of producers of concrete in a given area, then buyers of concrete have many choices. When you have less density, they have fewer choices. So density ought to be related to competition. Okay, so let's look at an example here of two markets. Market A, the blue dots are concrete companies. Okay, market A is a dense market, market B is a less dense market. Let's suppose you're a construction company, and it turns out construction companies are the biggest buyers of concrete, not surprisingly, and you're located at that square in each of those markets. Okay, but because of the big transport costs, you can't buy concrete from anywhere. They have to be close enough to whatever you're building for you to be able to buy from them. So in market A, you can buy from anyone within the shipment radius. Same in market B, but the difference is because of the differences in density, in market A, you have six choices. In market B, you have two. So we would think market A is more competitive than market B. And if our hypotheses about the relationship between a fit, uh, productivity and competition is right, we ought to see more high product, highly productive concrete companies in market A than market B. Okay? And it turns out that is exactly what you find. Okay? This is the distribution of the productivity levels of every concrete producer in the United States. And there's, about, there's over 5,000 of them. I've just divided it into the densest half of markets and the least dense half of markets. Okay? It's just above and below the median, a simple cut of the data. You can guess which distribution is the denser market, even without the labels. It's the solid curve. And you can see that in denser markets, there are systematically fewer, less efficient companies. Zero is the average productivity level producer in a given year. Uh, and there is a larger number of more efficient companies in denser markets. There's still a big spread, even within dense markets, even within less dense markets. But on average, productivity is higher in denser markets because of the competitive effects we were talking about. Here's another example of competition and productivity. And this is a trade story. So this is about iron ore. So most iron ore in the US that uh, comes from the US is mined in northern Minnesota in the Iron Range, okay? uh, north and west of Lake Superior. And it's put on boats in Duluth and sent to various buyers, usually on the Great Lakes, including the Gary Iron Works uh, just down the lake here. So this is the price of iron ore in the US between 1970 and 2004. And you can see throughout the 70s, iron ore prices were rising steadily. And then something happened in 1983. They sort of turned on a dime and then fell for several years and then kind of leveled off. Well, what happened in 1983 is for the first time, it became economical to take iron ore from Brazilian mines 
ship it up the Atlantic, down the St. Lawrence Seaway, through the Great Lakes, and then supply the Gary Ironworks and other places like it from Brazilian iron ore rather than from northern Minnesota. Okay, so that limited the ability of U.S. producers to raise their price anymore. And you can see it was basically capped by the, the Brazil-based price. Okay, but it did another thing. This ability of iron, of iron users in the U.S. to now switch to Brazilian iron ore forced U.S. mines to become more efficient. So if you look at productivity levels in U.S. mines, that's the blue line here. So what you see is from 1970 to 1982, there was no change in productivity. It was two tons per worker hour. Okay? And in fact, I found an old uh, U.S. Geological Survey book from 1950. Do you know what iron ore mine productivity was in the U.S. in 1950? Two tons per worker hour. Okay? So it didn't change for 30 years. And then the Brazilians show up. And within five years, it went up to four tons per worker hour. 30 years of nothing. Then in five years after competition starts, productivity has doubled. And it continued to rise after that until it was six tons per worker hour by 2004. Okay? Now it turns out there, this isn't about, this isn't sort of the Darwinian effect of the less efficient mines shut down, the more efficient mines grew. It was all within mines. So every individual mine raised their productivity level once they faced competition from the Brazilian mines. OK, let me move on to regulation, another sort of environmental factor. Regulatory policies can impose barriers to efficiency or incentives to be efficient. Okay? Now, regulations have many useful things, too. You all know about externalities. A lot of regulations are there to sort of fix problems with externalities. But that doesn't mean they won't have implications for productivity, or sometimes they'll by accident have implications for productivity because people aren't thinking about what incentives they might be uh, posing for productivity differences uh, by, by creating these regulations. Now, there is, a, there is an alternative hypothesis out there. This is sometimes called the Porter hypothesis. The Porter hypothesis is having new regulations put on a company sort of forces a, a kind of reckoning. Okay, because this goes back a little bit to the management practice story. That the idea of the Porter hypothesis is, well, okay, now we have to abide by this new regulation. That's going to change how we operate. Since we have to change how we operate, why don't we just think about our entire process from scratch and redesign it in the, in the best way possible? Okay, that and that sort of redesign from the ground up could actually raise productivity after the regulations put in place. That's the Porter hy hypothesis. So uh, in work with uh, Michael Greenstone and John List, also here at, at Chicago, we've studied the effect of the US Clean Air Act amendments on US manufacturers in terms of their productivity levels. So the Clean Air Act amendments say, well, look, you can't pollute uh, too much ozone or uh, sulfur dioxide or carbon monoxide or total su suspended particulates. And if you do, we're going to force you to put on abatement equipment to reduce your emissions. We find that companies that are subject to these regulations do, in fact, see a drop in their productivity level. They have to take some inputs that used to be put into making stuff, and now those inputs, workers and capital both, are being applied to abide by uh, the tenets of the regulation. You add all that up across all the affected manufacturers, and that says, suggests that the Clean Air Act amendments cost $21 billion in terms of lost manufacturing output. Now, keep in mind, that's one side of the seesaw. The other side is the health benefits from having less pollution. We don't try to measure that in our work, but other people have tried to do that and suggest that those might be in the sort of low triple digit billion. So this suggests actually, even though there's a cost here, and it's a real cost, 21 billion bucks a year, you know, on balance, we're actually getting more benefit out of these regulations than it's costing us in terms of lost productivity. Here's another example of how regulations, this is sort of like ac accidental productivity effects of regulations. This is from the U.S. Sugar Act. Okay? So the U.S. Sugar Act was passed during the New Deal. It was one of the programs of the New Deal. And of course, as you might guess, it was about 
how sugar is produced in the country. And it lasted, it was passed 1934, it lasted in 1974. The way it worked is it was, it was basically a big uh, money shuffling scheme where farmers would be paid a subsidy based on the total amount of sugar in their beets. So this isn't about sugar cane, this part, this is about sugar beets. By the way, sugar beets are not like the things you get in your salad, they're about like that big and red. Sugar beets are about that big and white, okay? And they're about, you know, 15 to 20 percent sugar and a bunch of sugar comes from beets. Other sugar comes from cane, but in the U.S., I, th I think it's about half and half, okay? So they subsidize farmers for growing sugar beets, and the total subsidy was just the gross amount of sugar in all the beets you farm, we're going to pay you a subsidy. How did they pay for that subsidy? They being the government, they taxed sugar refiners, okay? So they said, all right, for every unit of sugar you make, we're going to take some of that money and we're going to pay it to the farmers for having grown that sugar in the first place. Now, of course, the companies aren't going to like this, so the government said, all right, we'll make a trade. If you let us tax your production, we're going to let you fix prices, okay? And we're not going to sue you for antitrust. They said, okay, we can live with that. Here we go. Uh, so in essence, this was basically a tax on consumers to pay farmers to grow sugar beets. All right. So if you think about the incentives, and I, some of you might be sugar beet farmers, but I'm going to assume you're not. Well, if you're a farmer, you just want to maximize how much sugar you have in your beets. So it turns out what you want to do, uh, botanically speaking, is grow the biggest darn beets you can. Okay? The problem with that is when you grow beets, you have more big beets, you have more sugar, but the sugar per unit weight gets smaller and smaller. So it's harder and harder to refine actual sugar out of your big honking beets. Okay? So it's your productivity in the beet in the sugar refining business goes down. Okay, and again, sugar companies aren't going to like that, but remember they're able to fix prices. So if they're inefficient and have high costs, that's fine. They just charge consumers higher prices, okay? So what you would expect, given this regulation, is you're going to have low refining productivity. In other words, you're not going to get much sugar out of each ton of beets that goes into the factory. This is, over the entire 20th century, the profile of refining efficiency in U.S. sugar refining. So at the beginning of the 20th century, they were able to get about 220 pounds out of sugar, refined crystal sugar, out of each ton of beets. That went up steadily until, guess what? The Sugar Act is passed in 1934. Then it proceeded to fall steadily until, guess when? The Sugar Act is repealed in 1974, at which time it turns around and goes back up again. Okay. So between 1934 and 1974, efficiency in sugar refining fell from 315 tons or pounds per ton down to 200 and say 40 or so. So by about a third almost. Okay, we basically lost, and in fact, by the end of the century, we were back up to 300. We weren't even at the level we were at when the sugar act was passed. We lost basically a century's worth of technological progress because of uh, regulation. And the regulation, bear in mind, had no direct impact on sugar refining. It wasn't about pollution coming from sugar factories. It was just about this scheme to take money from consumers and give it to farmers. Yet, because it wasn't thought out, it had these efficiency implications that really added up. Okay, the last thing, uh, the last external factor I want to talk about briefly is this input market flexibility. Okay, so if you think, I talked about this Darwinian process that the market can take activity away from less efficient producers and give it to more efficient producers. Well, if that's going to happen, you need the market to be able to move inputs from less efficient to more efficient producers. L labor has to be able to move. Capital has to be able to move. Okay? And it turns out there are big differences across countries and within countries over time to some extent in how efficiently input markets work. Okay? And it turns out that this stuff seems to be related to productivity outcomes as well. Average productivity differences across countries 
and industry. So just as a kind of a, a motivating example, if you want to say, well, how would we measure whether this Darwinian process is working? One thing you could imagine is just look at the correlation between size and productivity. If the Darwinian process is working well, that should be kind of big. Like the most efficient producers ought to be the largest. Okay? If it's not working, you'd have zero correlation. And if it's perversely working, it would be negative, that the most efficient producers would be the smallest, the uh, least efficient would be the largest. If you look at the Eastern European countries around the time of the transition out of being a planned communist economy and into being a market economy, you see a pretty systematic relationship between, this is the correlation between productivity and size. At the beginning, okay, there was actually in most of these countries a negative correlation. The most efficient companies were the smallest, the least efficient were the largest. Okay? But over the 90s, as they transitioned to a market economy, the market started taking inputs away from less efficient companies and moving them to more efficient companies. And that correlation within countries ran from negative to positive. The exception, turns out, is Estonia, which actually was reasonably uh, positively correlated before and actually fell a little bit over the 90s. But most of the Eastern European transition economies, you saw the shift from negative to positive correlation. What are sort of the big questions still out there that people are working on, including myself? Well, one is, I talked about all these different productivity drivers. They're not all equally important in every market. What is it that determines how important each one is in each market? Where is management the most important? Where is it the least important? Why? What is it about markets that make it management more important, for example, in this market than that? How important are demand factors versus supply factors? Okay. How much of this Darwinian process is driven by consumers being able to switch versus input markets working better? That the, uh, you know, the labor market has improved, so workers are more willing to switch companies or whatever. Is it management or managers that matter? I was talking about management practices, okay? But is it something, can you, do you, is it about the person or is it just the practice? Can I take any old person and just say, do these 38 things and everything is going to be great? Or is there some interaction about the type of person implementing those practices that matter? How badly are resources misallocated? There's a lot of work being done on this right now. A lot of it here at Chicago in particular, me and other folks are trying to understand why you sort of end up in these situations where, for example, in the worst cases, you have a negative correlation between productivity and size. How did the market get there, and why isn't it working to sort of straighten that correlation uh, around and turn it positive? So, moreover, can we predict innovation? Can we tell by looking at companies which ones are going to have productivity growth in the future? And then what is the role of or hope for policies that encourage productivity growth? And there's a whole different there's a whole set of possible things here, and we're just starting to scratch the surface. OK, so that's all I've got at this point. But I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. That's a great question. Finance is the worst, because what is the output of a bank? What is the output of a bank? It is not clear what the output of a bank is. Okay. Uh, do you know, actually, here's a, a story I like. Do you know how they used to, the BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, puts together the GDP numbers? It is my understanding, and I, I think this story is true, and even if it's not such a good story, I'm going to tell it anyway. Uh, the way they used to measure productivity growth in the banking sector, because it's really hard to measure productivity in banking, is by looking at the number of checks cleared per unit input. Okay, because why? Because at least they could measure how many checks were cleared, right? But to imagine that like that is the sum total of the output of, of banks is crazy. Okay, and of course now checks are, the productivity in banks now would look terrible because checks are going to zero. So banks, no one's figured that out. Services, you can always go with revenue. So it's revenue per unit input, but there's a problem there, and this is something I worked on a lot, Revenue is price times quantity, right? Now, if price is about quality differences, we're probably okay. If you think 
you know, higher quality, like I said, if you're making a higher quality car, even if you're making the same number of cars per worker as before, you might think you're more productive because like in some quality adjusted units, you're making more. But what if price is high because competition in the market fell? Okay, or someone imposed a, a trade tariff and you were able to raise prices. You haven't become more efficient, you're just able to charge higher prices. So that's tough. How do you sort of separate price variation that's not about efficiency versus price, efficient, or price variation that is about efficiency? And people are working on ways to do that, but nothing's really perfect yet. But that's one of the things you have to deal with once you get out of the simple world of, I can count cubic yards of concrete, I can count loaves of bread, but you can't do that for a lot of producers. So that's a great question. There are definitely, there are definitely good case studies of companies that have implemented sort of, not necessarily Six Sigma per se, but, or any particular kind of lean, but just sort of, systematic, routinized ways of thinking about production processes and gotten productivity gains from that. We don't have a lot of sort of experimental evidence of the Indian textile manufacturing kind, but it would point to there being a possibility that this stuff really causally matters. I agree with that. And I think now what's going on in this area is this, a lot of this stuff was sort of invented within manufacturing, okay, because manufacturing in some senses is a very inherently process-driven thing, but now people are taking these techniques and moving them into other sectors, okay. So one I know about uh, from my own work is healthcare. So there are actually hospitals now that run on the Toyota production system, all right. So they think about every process in a very systematic way you know, where does all the components of time come in? You know, when we have to wait for an hour for a lab result, why does that happen? Does it have to be an hour, that sort of thing? And sort of routinizing the process of healthcare delivery. Now there's resistance to that among he some healthcare providers, but there is some, again, more anecdotal at this point than anything else, evidence that this stuff actually has real benefits. So you're you're seeing it, but I, 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 I don't think we're quite at the point where we just systematically know it, it works with high degree of certainty. Yes? Are there any significant correlation between businesses that were founded by like, a family business or businesses with management that are, that mm -hmm. are in house from technical? Yes. So, one of the interesting results of the World Management Survey is that. On average, family-owned companies don't seem to be more or less poorly managed than non-family-owned companies. However, if you focus in on family-owned companies that are, whose CEO is the eldest son of the founder, <laughs> they are systematically more poorly managed. <laughs> okay, so, and you can imagine why. What are the odds that the eldest son of the founder just happens to be the best possible manager available for this company. Probably not very high, and so it, uh, when you see companies that actually are run that way, they, they don't seem to have as high quality management practices. If you divide up by all sorts of different ownership structures, the, high, the, the best managed companies are the sort of publicly held companies, where you diffuse shareholders with the board of directors on average have the best management practices. Yep. So in some cases, you saw that uh, companies within, within the company, they raised productivity in response to external competition, mm -hmm. like with the iron ore. So that means they could have raised it before, and yes. they probably raised their profits to light yeah. That is a great question, too. It's like, why are you willing to be inefficient? So uh, Sir John Hicks, the economist, said, the best of all monopoly profits is a quiet life. Okay? And what that, I think, means is you don't have to try very hard when you don't face competition. You might not be the most efficient you could be, but to some extent, who cares? And if it takes effort, even if it's a small effort, and even if it's a small effort compared to the productivity gains that you could get if you implemented these changes, you might not do it. Okay? Moreover, you know, it's easy for us to think about in, in a sort of static world, but you know, you got your average cost curve, you kind of figure out where the bottom is, that's where you should operate, that's where you minimize cost. 
But in reality, sort of best practice is a moving target. It's moving all the time. Demand side stuff, supply side stuff is always shifting around the best way to operate your company. And you, we, it seems to be that just companies who don't face a lot of competition just don't put a lot of effort on trying to make those constant changes to follow best practice, where if you do have a lot of competition, you have no choice. And so I think it's, it's that. But you're right. In some sense, these mines were leaving money on the table. Um, well, it's a little tricky. They were leaving money on the table, but what, they, what was happening is the workers were basically taking a lot of leisure on the job. That's another way to think about it. They were getting the rents of that inefficiency by not having to work very hard. So that, that, that study that those numbers are from goes into high detail about how the mines change their operations and basically change rules about who could do what, when at these mines to become more efficient. And before it was basically, I was a, I was a repair person and I would only have to repair one kind of truck and if nothing broke, I didn't have to do anything. But after the Brazilians showed up, now I got to repair anything that goes wrong and I'm working a greater portion of the day. So in some sense, it's the rents got moved from workers to put into the efficiency gains of production operations. Yeah. Uh, my question, I think, is uh, related to the previous one. So why the low productivity isn't to compete away? Yeah. So that's a great question. It is in the sense that mo almost always when you look Within, you know, like I said, uh, low productivity predicts exit. So markets are always kind of chopping off the less efficient, and you typically see reallocation from less efficient to more efficient. So the process is working, but it turns out, and we don't need to go into detail, there are a lot of reasons why that process doesn't end up with one really big producer who's as efficient as you could ever be, and they serve the entire market. You can still have dispersion and productivity in equilibrium, even in a world where the market is sort of working, if there are frictions in either the output markets or the product markets. And some of those frictions are policy driven, and you might change policies to, but other things are just like, look, I can't ship. I could be the most efficient concrete producer in the world, but if I make it here in Chicago, I can't send it to someone in Miami, no matter how badly they want that to happen. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.